Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. We happen to be pre-recording today due to a very early morning obligation that we have, so we're on the road headed to an appointment while this broadcast is going out, but we wanted to bring the teaching Part 1 of Luke, chapter 11. Jesus, teach us to pray. Luke 11, part 1. In Luke 11, Jesus concerns himself with conveying to us what the character of our prayer life should be. The early Christians were known to greet one another with the words, Do I find you praying? If the disciples were in fact men and women of prayer, then the prayer they emulated was found in the prayer life of Jesus, witnessed by the apostles, taught upon extensively by Jesus himself, and passed down to you and me. Do I find you praying? If you are found in prayer, are you praying according to the pattern that Jesus taught, or some other form of prayer not reflective of what Jesus would expect from us in our prayer endeavors. If I could recommend a book to you, I would recommend a book by Watchman Nee called Let Us Pray. Watchman Nee, Let Us Pray. It's one of the most practical, helpful books. It's not very long. It's not 100, maybe 120 pages. It will revolutionize your understanding of prayer. But let's begin by reading Luke 11 verses 1 through 32, please. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine is in a journey, in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are in bed with me, and I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, Though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, or his constant knocking. (laughs) Importunity in prayer, that's a phrase you should remember. Importunity in prayer. He will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is his father, um, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? Serp- yes, a serpent. Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. And it came to pass, when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. But some of them said, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And others, tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out devils through Beelzebub, and if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, hmm, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges." But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. 
But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. He that is not with me is against me, and he that it gathereth not with me scattereth. And when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh him to with I'm sorry, taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. And it came to pass as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the, the path, birth of the Catholic Church, right there. Oh dear. The paths which thou hast sucked. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. <laughs> and when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was the sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South shall rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. What an amazing thing that when Jesus saw the crowd gather thick together. In other words, they just came in, they were pressing, they were excited, they were going to see something. When we look at that, we say, it's a revival, it's an outpouring. Bring the television cameras, let's get this broadcast around the world. When Jesus looked at it, he said, that's an evil generation. Come on. Selah. Mm -hmm. That should cause us to think. Because he's saying it's not about what we see, it's about receiving the wisdom that comes from the Son of God. Notice that he's advancing. He said it's the wisdom that you should be seeking, not the signs. So, in Luke 11, Jesus takes upon himself to instruct his disciples regarding prayer. Here we gain invaluable insight into Jesus. Now think about it. As a sinless man, in total union and communion with the Father, he prays. And how he would be pleased for us to pray likewise. I'll never forget the day the Lord told me I was struggling in prayer. He said, Russ, I'm sinless, I'm perfect, I'm at the right hand of God, <laughs> and I'm ever interceding. If I have to pray, you have to pray. He sure enough said that. That just helped me so much. <laughs> See, this is something that the disciples would have witnessed, the prayer life of Jesus, because he prayed in their company many times. Peter, James, and John, they went with Jesus to the Mount of Transfiguration, and they would have heard Jesus praying in this manner when Elijah and Moses appeared before them. We have to realize that prayer, even for one such as Jesus, who was sinless, who was perfect, who was very God in the flesh, it was still necessary for him to pray. If Jesus found it necessary to pray, guess what? It is also necessary for you and I to pray. Prayerlessness and the attitudes that bring it about are the great enemy of your faith and your walk with God. The human spirit, listen, the human spirit must pray as the body must breathe. When breathing stops, Life ends. When prayer is absent, spiritual death rules. Do I find you praying? Now in prayer, Jesus begins with acknowledging, with acknowledging the relationship between himself and God on high by calling him Father. And that's what got him crucified. Now, we know that God was Jesus' Father. What about us? Is it legitimate to call him Father? One question I am consistently asked 
over the years that I've been doing this ministry is people will come to me and say, who is this father you keep talking about? (laughs) Do you know Jesus? In other words, there's a segment of Christians out there to whom the concept of father is an alien concept and anyone who presumptively calls God his father, they identify that. That must be a cult. That must be, they just must not know who Jesus is. Uh, That tells me that these believers are deaf to the spirit of adoption on the inside of them crying, Abba, Father. In John 20, now bear in mind, in John 20, 17, Jesus declared as he was ascending, he told Mary, I am ascending to my father and to your father. God being your papa is the most basic truth of your relationship with God. God is your father by the virtue of the provisions of the cross. And as your father then, it is fitting to hallow his name and to declare, my daddy would have whooped me if I'd have called him Mr. Walden. (laughs) No, he was my daddy. He was my father. And we are to address God. Thy kingdom come, Father, as in earth, so in heaven. Now, we also see how Jesus saw the world around him in this prayer. All that Jesus believed for and worked for to bring about was, as in heaven, so on earth. The work of the cross was all about, as in heaven, so on earth. Is there any suffering in heaven? No. Is there any sickness in heaven? No. Is there any poverty in heaven? Are there food stamps in heaven? Are there payday loan places in heaven? Are there any broken relationships or broken lives or any such thing in heaven? No, of course not. Mm -hmm. Then we know that no such things are God's will for us on the earth because God's will on the earth is as in heaven, so on earth. You can instantly know the perfect will of God. You do not have to be a theologian. All you have to ask yourself in the situation you find yourself in, what would it look like in the context of as in heaven, so on earth? What if your marriage, what would it look like as in heaven, so on earth? What would your bank account look like as in heaven, so on earth? What kind of car would you drive if you needed a car as in heaven, so on earth? What would be your health if it was in the context, the expression of as in heaven, so on earth? This is the will of God we are to pray out and to ask the Father concerning each and every day and each and every need that we have. And then we are to ask God to give us daily provisions. Some people say God will not answer prayer regarding things you can take care of yourself. (laughs) Why must we ask, Mm -hmm. give us this day our daily bread? Because God gave man dominion. Part of that is Jesus is the bread of life. And they would go out and pick up the manna in the Old Testament, but if they tried to keep it till the next day, it would breed worms. What Jesus was to you yesterday will breed worms this morning. You need a daily Jesus. Amen. Like Kitty said, he's a simple Savior. Not mm-hmm. only that, he's a daily Savior. Amen. And it's a fact that who he was to you yesterday might not be who he is today because he's always unfolding himself. But this also applies to everyday needs. You see, God will do nothing. Why do you have to ask God for what he knows you need? Because God will do nothing except a man first ask him. It doesn't matter that God knows exactly what you have need of. What God knows, listen to me, what God knows does not prompt him to ask. It is only when man asks that God will then move to provide you what it was already intended in his heart all along to see that you were given. He was looking for some fellowship in the beginning and relationship. See, he's not holding out on you. God is a God of order. He gave man dominion over all the earth. And that means that you must invite God into your situation by prayer and petition. And only then will God move to do the thing that he was already disposed to do in the first place. I've heard people say that. Oh, God knows what I need if he wants to give it to me. That is absolutely contrary to how Jesus taught. He taught us to ask God openly for, and I believe it should be verbal. Prayer that is unexpressed, non-verbalized prayer is not prayer, it's just wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. 
So we are to ask for daily provisions. And now notice, now we get to what an evangelical would have put at the top of the list. Forgive us our trespasses. Forgive our sins. That is only addressed after acknowledging God as Father. You know why? Because if God isn't your Father, you can forget about dealing with sin. You're incapable of dealing with sin unless God's your Father. So you only deal with sins after acknowledging Him as Father. And then you can ask him about daily bread. Oh, how carnal. You're asking for daily bread when you ought to be dealing with that sin in your life. Well, God's not an evangelical. God doesn't think those ways. Shouldn't we ask for forgiveness of sins first? Not if we're going to pray like Jesus prayed. Because God made provision. Why? God made provision for Christ to become our Father even before we knew our need of a Savior. In other words, first and foremost, before dealing with sin, you cannot deal with sin unless it's in the context of knowing God as Father. We were inveterate sinners and completely unrepentant when God gave us heaven's best. So before all else, the acknowledgement is that of Father God. You cannot deal with sin unless you do so as a son relating to Father God. And then, okay, God's my father. Now let's get that dirty old sin out of my life. Well, hold on now. What about daily bread? You need groceries, don't you? Oh, that's not spiritual. You need to deal with sin first. Really? Is that true? Not according to the way Jesus prayed. See, before all else, our acknowledgement is first of the fatherhood of God and then for daily bread. Isn't that unspiritual, though? Shouldn't we humble ourselves regarding sin first before being so crass as to ask God for our basic needs, not as far as Jesus is concerned? Why? I'm so glad you asked that. I love an inquisitive class. Because God reigns on the just and on the unjust. He gives to all men, great and small, breath and life, whether they serve him or not. We might think that God will not answer the prayer from a person who has sin in their life, But if that's the case, then how come Jesus doesn't have them dealing with sin before they ask for daily bread? No, whether you're in sin or not, you ask God for daily bread, he's going to give it to you. Are you listening to me? I know that's not the way evangelicals think, but again, God is so much more than an evangelical. He's not even a Christian. Can you imagine it? (laughs) So... Then we're to ask him not to lead us into temptation. Now, what does this mean? Did not James say in James 1.13 that we should not say when we are tempted, we are tempted of God? So James is correcting Jesus. Because Jesus is saying, it's like there is a disparity between this passage in Luke and what James said about temptation in James 1.13. And because of this, Martin Luther And many other prominent churchmen have suggested and in fact insisted that the book of James does not belong in our canon of scripture. And can I go a step further? I I could say they are not with those arguments are not without merit. I would not take one book of the 66 books of the Bible out of the Bible. But if I had to take one, it would probably be the book of James. But I'm not taking the book. No, you're not. (laughs) Are you okay? (laughs) Everybody breathe. Everybody breathe. (laughs) Snorkel gear. We're good. But what is it in the context of what James says and what Jesus says here? What is to be our understanding to pray that that we not be led into temptation? See, the tempting that Jesus is referring to is not understood unless you look at the original language word. It's about God. God does not entice us to sin the way Satan does. The word tempt here would be better understood as to test, like to test our metal or to test our resolve, such as when God told Abraham to take Isaac up on the mountain and sacrifice him. He wasn't tempting Abraham to sin. He was finding out and letting Abraham find out what was on the inside of him. So what Jesus is saying, that we do not want to leave such a matter unsaid between you and God. We are to preemptively demonstrate to God before trials come that our minds are made up to serve him in such a way that will exempt you from circumstances 
by which otherwise your resolve might need to be proven. And if you're listening, what that means is, and it's one of the most powerful things in my personal walk with God, is everything's negotiable in God. And there are things that people preach, this is how God always is. I've gone to God and I've said, I know this is how they say you always are, but I want to negotiate. And some of the most powerful blessings I've walked in have come because God said, I'm so glad you asked. I've been waiting for somebody to ask me that. That's so kind of God. (laughs) Wait, he said, I have the answer. What's the question? (laughs) So in verses 5 through 10, then, Jesus begins to talk about importunity in prayer, the importunity with which God's heart is disposed to answer. He gives us the example of a man prevailing upon the inconvenience of a friend to provide for a need. Are you willing to inconvenience God? Is that even possible? Jesus is saying that we should ask as though God is not disposed to listen. That we should ask and keep on asking. We are to knock and keep on knocking. Why? Is God hard of hearing? Is he stubborn? We are to seek and keep on seeking. He's telling us something very important that you may not have ever considered. If you ask and keep on asking, if you seek and keep on seeking, if you knock and keep on knocking, if you do that, you will receive, you will find, you will have the door open to you. This tells us that prayer for something once is not enough. That's right. Not because God is hard of hearing, but listen to me, here it is, because prayer is a layered thing that must be laid down over time in order to penetrate our own carnal attitudes and successfully express the confidence that we have in the Father to meet the need that we've brought before him. Prayer is a layered thing. It's like I'm going on a diet and you don't eat a piece of chocolate cake and you're mad because you're not 100 pounds lighter the next morning. No, losing weight is a layered thing. Prayer is a layered thing that requires a continuation. There are people that say asking for more than once is a sin. That's not true. If that's true, then Jesus is enticing us to sin by saying pray and keep on praying until the assurance and the substance of what we're asking for is provided. This is what prevailing in prayer looks like. This is what the old divines used to call praying through or praying through to the assurance. Now, in verses 11 through 13, we see another false doctrine of the church exposed. Men teach that you can ask God all you want, but he may choose in his sovereignty not to give you something you did not ask for. Now, what Jesus is saying, if you ask for an egg, is he going to give you a scorpion? If you ask for bread, is he going to give you a stone? Now, theologians and leaders teach this. They teach that you can ask for health, but sometimes God, in his sovereignty, they allege, will give you disease or sickness. They teach that you can ask for provision, But God may, in fact, be disposed to keep you impoverished for some inscrutable reason. One Christian author, a quadriplegic, she claims that when she experienced her accident, when she dived off a diving board into two feet of water and broke her neck and was crippled from the neck down, uh, paralyzed, she said that it was God's will to break her neck and make her a quadriplegic for her entire life. She quotes a verse that it pleased God to bruise him, talking about Jesus. So she thinks that she's righteous enough and holy enough that somehow her suffering was meritorious for sin and that God was pleased to afflict her. That's, if that's true, then Jesus is in error, Saying, if you ask for bread, will he give you a stone? If you ask for an egg, will he give you a scorpion? And by my stripes, you're healed. Right. See, it's very difficult to challenge the suppositions of a disabled person striving to make the best out of a bad situation. How dare you? How dare you question my faith? I'm not questioning her faith. She is challenging. She is lodging an obscene accusation against the faithfulness of God. So the question you must ask yourselves, however, is will we allow even such a pitiful person to slander the name of God with such a vile statement? Where do your fidelities lie? Jesus makes the will of God perfectly to know. Is is this woman going to be a quadriplegic in heaven? No, she's not. 
She is supposed to believe and to pray as in heaven, so on earth. What if she doesn't get it? Doesn't matter. If she never sees a healing, it's not God's fault. And her obligation, whether she receives the healing or not, is to believe for as in heaven, so on earth. See, God, will, Jesus is making the will of God perfectly known to us. He will not harm us in any way. And when we ask him for what is needful and wholesome, he will in no way do otherwise, regardless of who claims that he will. We must defend in our thinking against all obscene suggestions. And if you have a leader or a pastor or a minister who's teaching that to you, you need to get away from that church, that ministry, or that leader because they're contaminating your faith and they're teaching an obscenity in the place of what Jesus proclaims in Luke chapter 1, 11. Now, in verses 14 through 26, we find Jesus answering an accusation that he's casting out devils by the prince of devils. A house divided, Jesus declares, cannot stand. And then Jesus says, he is the stronger man who casts out devils by the finger of God, casting out the demons that would hold man in bondage. Now listen, Jesus is not giving a methodology by which we must provoke a demon to identify himself. Everybody wants to talk to a demon. I don't want to talk to a demon. Why do I want to interview you know, whenever they, the Super Bowl is over, they don't uh, interview the losing quarterback. Why am I worried about interviewing the losing team? Why do, I have to know, why do I have to have a conversation? Why are you deferring to the losing team? Why don't you just understand that the stronger one, Jesus, is on the inside of you and you just command the enemy to shut up and come out? See, we have to guard against superstition when it comes to addressing the demonic. Unfortunately, much of the practice regarding the expulsion of demons today is more rooted in vulgar sensationalism than actually being effective at setting people free. And you really need a good, a good look at the stupidity and the obscenity and the superstition that dominates uh, Christian thinking and evangelical thinking when it comes to demons. Go do a YouTube search of Win Worley and just take a look at some of the shenanigans that demons love to put on, the show they love to put on because people have become so absorbed and so enticed by the sensationalism of the demonic that they're willing to allow the devil to put on his dog and pony show rather than seeing people truly get free. Jesus warns us then. He says, Nature hates a vacuum is in essence what he says. That if a demon is cast out, you need to prepare to deny that devil access to your life by doing what? Reversing the behavior. Jesus always said, go and sin no more. Demons don't just take over somebody's life. There's a means and a predicate. There's a predicating behavior and we need to identify what that is. And then finally... In our study of Luke 11, part 1, Jesus encounters a woman praising his mother, praising Mary. And Jesus corrects the woman saying that the blessing is not upon Mary. I'm surprised Jesus didn't cast the devil out of this woman. <laughs> I, I really am. Because the blessing is not upon Mary. It is not Mary that should receive our laudation. Jesus, I find very few born-again Catholics that will say they ever pray to Mary. They understand the Catholic Church teaches that, but a born-again Catholic who's filled with the Holy Spirit, I've known so many of them, and I've yet to find one of the dozens that I've come into relationship with over the years that continued to pray to Mary after they became born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus is saying that this kind of thinking is dead superstition. The blessing of God is not upon religious superstition. The blessing of God is... Look at the pragmatism of Jesus. The, the blessing of God is upon those who hear the word and keep it. Not the letter, but the spirit of what he's teaching. This is where the blessing rests, and this is where the goodness of God is seen. By what we believe, by our receptiveness, and by the fact that we not only hear... And see, that's what evangelicals do. Evangelicals think if they say amen to good preaching that they ought to be blessed. No, <laughs> you have to actually put into practice what God's word teaches. Kitty, would you pray? 
thank you, Father, for this lesson. We thank you that you taught us so much in your word, and you even need to teach us how to pray. And yes, Jesus, we know that you ever lived to make intercession, and we thank you for it. We thank you that we're going to be more diligent in our praying. We're going to spend more time in prayer because, as our sainted grandmother said, much prayer, much power. Little prayer and little power. We believe your word, Father God. Help us to obey your word. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.